that couple of months. I've been pretty well. You know? um, so if you guys can compare it to the couple of months, and I'm going to be able to do it maybe next year. You know? This is a very simple song. But it has a great message. If you've ever wondered or thought, I can't be in the church doing what I want to do because of a job or family or whatever, and you leave feeling guilty, there is one thing that you always can do, and that is to pray for others, to intercede for them before the throne of God. We're commanded to do that. That's what we need to be doing as Christians lifting each other up, and that's what this song is about. Somebody prayed for me.
Good morning. Welcome. Glad you all are here. A um, couple of quick announcements. First of all, don't forget to, that today is our regular scheduled business meeting. So immediately after this service, we will have hopefully a reasonably short business meeting. Um, also, I just wanted to kind of dovetail what the choir was singing and, and what Bonnie said. And just stop and think about the fact that there are people in each of our lives that if you're not the one praying for them, then who is? Um, you know, you want to be prayed for. We all want to be prayed for. And, you know, just, just stop and think about the fact that you very possibly are the only person praying for some people. And that kind of puts the brings the, the responsibility home to us that um, there, are, there are people out there who are relying on you to, to pray for them. And so I just want to encourage you to, you know, uh, sometimes, I, I mean, I get it. When, when we're praying, sometimes it seems um, just kind of tough. But you need to do it. It's, it's a, an important part of, of who we are. Now, um, next week we are going to go have some of the people from Frost, Minnesota here, and we're going to go through the, the training um, for the, the Bible study or the Bible school that we're going to be helping them with. And I just want to um, say, if you haven't yet signed up to go, it will be a week of your time, yes, but what an, a great opportunity for us to get to go and minister to, to somebody else. And so I just want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up, uh, please prayerfully consider signing up to, to go. We're going to go to Frost, Minnesota. It will be the last week of June when we go. And so we will have our Bible school here. And then on Saturday, we'll drive up there. And, and be up there for a week. We'll come home on July the 1st. So look at your calendar and, and step up and, and volunteer to go and be a part of this. It, it, you know, don't, don't be intimidated or scared off by this. It's a, it's a neat opportunity. Now we're here to worship this morning, and so let's do that. Clear, clear your mind of everything except Jesus and make Him the, the, the focal point this morning. Every song you sing, every, every thought you think, make it be about Jesus. Let's go to Him in prayer now. Jesus, thank You. Everything that we have is because of You. Everything, um, every, every blessing, every gift, every benefit, uh, every breath we take, we have You to thank. And so I just, um, I, I want this to be about You now. And I just pray that you will help us through the, the work and the ministry of your Holy Spirit. I, I pray for your movement in our midst right now. That you will, you will draw each of us to you. And that we will be just completely about you now. In Jesus' name, in your precious name I pray. Amen. this morning and I do want to mention if you feel ever that you need to sit by all means uh, I invite you to stand because it's far easier to worship when you're standing but if you need to sit if you feel if the spirits leading you to sit and worship there if you just feel in general that you need to sit down and worship you are not judged anything like that by all means feel free to sit oh, ignore him for right now <laughs> That all being said, let's praise and let's give God the glory. To God be glory and praise.
as we continue in praise, we praise God and give him the glory. But let us continue to worship that glorious Christ who lives, who surrounds us, who lives within us, who gives us grace and gives us mercy. Let us continue in praise.
Father, I thank you. I thank you for your, your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your glory. And I give you all honor and all praise. Father, it's because of you that we're able to gather here today to worship you. It's because of your grace and your mercy that we're able to to give you praise. It's because of your love that we're able, we were able to then exude that love to others. That we were able, that we were able now to, 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 to show your light in this dark world. Father, I thank you. And Father, I, I pray that we would, that we would continue to praise you in scripture and in teaching today that we would know that you are here. Thank you, Father, for all that you do, for everything that you are. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Children's Church is dismissed. Bring about a, a difference doesn't come from the preacher, it comes from the Word of God. And 
with that being said, what I want to do today is begin by reading the scripture that, that I want to speak from so that we have the Word of God fresh in our ears and so that um, the, the Holy Spirit is, is as empowered as, as I know how to make Him or to, to, to work. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning with verse 18 says, the message about the cross doesn't make sense to lost people. But for those of us who are being saved, it is God's power at work. As God says in the scriptures, I will destroy the wisdom of all who claim to be wise. I will confuse those who think they know so much. What happened to those wise people? What happened to those experts in the scriptures? What happened to the ones who think they have all the answers? Didn't God show that the wisdom of this world is foolish? God was wise and decided not to let the people of this world use their wisdom to learn about Him. Instead, God chose to save only those who believe the foolish message we preach. Jews ask for miracles, and Greeks or Gentiles want something that sounds wise. But we preach that Christ was nailed to a cross. Most Jews have problems with this, and most Gentiles think it's foolish. Our message is God's power and wisdom for the Jews and the Greeks that He has chosen. Even when God is foolish, He is wiser than everyone else. Even when God is weak, He is stronger than everyone else. My dear friends, remember what you were when God chose you. The people of this world didn't think that many of you were wise. Only a few of you were in places of power, and not many of you came from important families. But God chose the foolish things of this world to put the wise to shame. He chose the weak things of this world to put the powerful to shame. What the world thinks is worthless, useless, and nothing at all is what God has used to destroy what the world considers important. God did all of this to keep anyone from bragging to him. You are God's children. He sent Christ Jesus to save us and to make us wise, acceptable, and holy. If you want to brag, do what the scriptures say and brag about the Lord. Friends, when I came to you, um, when I came and told you the mystery that God had shared with us, I didn't use big words or try to sound wise. In fact, while I was with you, I made up my mind to speak only about Christ Jesus who had been nailed to a cross. At first I was weak and trembling with fear. When I talked with you or preached, I didn't try to prove anything by sounding wise. I simply let God's Spirit show His power. That way you would have faith because of God's power and not because of human wisdom. Christianity does not make sense. From a human standpoint, to be executed by crucifixion is a complete and total human failure. And that's exactly why God did it that way. It was, and and that's exactly what Paul is telling his readers and and therefore telling us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, he, he says the message of the cross doesn't make sense. And, and that's, that's the point. God does not need us to tell him how things need to be. You know, long before humans came along, God was doing things God's way. And God doesn't need us to show up and say, well, that's not the way that's supposed to work. This is the way it's supposed to work. And, and it's so important that we understand this. This is, this is central to getting Christianity. Now, remember Job. When Job was going through his suffering and he was dealing with, with all of the misery and all of the, the, the pain and the, the trouble that he was dealing with, he finally reached a point where he had had enough. And he, he finally cried out to God in anger and in frustration. And he basically said, God, you owe me an explanation. You know, I don't deserve this. You owe me an explanation. 
And we do that, don't we? If you haven't personally, I'll bet you have heard someone at some point or another say, when I get to heaven, God's going to have some splaining to do. You know, uh, we, we do that. And, and that's, that's the ridiculousness of us, that, that we somehow think God owes us anything whatsoever. And it's, it's interesting because God answers Job. Uh, God responds to Job and he says, Job, you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Oh, that's right, you weren't here. Or Job, um, ha have you ever in your, your short little life ever commanded the sun to rise? Or the sun to set? N no, no you haven't. Or, or Job, have you ever um, seen where light lives or darkness resides? No, no, you haven't. Or, or Job, have you ever been in control of the constellations so that you guide their path across the sky? Let me guess. No, Job, you've never done that. So shut up. You know, that, that's, that's in essence what, what God is telling him. You don't have a voice here. You don't have any reason to be telling me how things are to be done. And, and this is what we need to understand. That um, wh whether it's running the universe or whether it's deciding how a person comes to salvation, we don't get to tell God how it's done. Humans in our thinking can't hold even a candle to the way God does things. And so what God does is He says, well, you humans, you think you're so smart, and you think this is how everything has to happen, and this is the way you think it makes sense. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do exactly the opposite. And the reason God does that is so that only people who embrace God through God's way can ever possibly know Him. That's, that's it. He set the bar in such a way that you cannot know God unless you know God, God's way. And so that's what Paul is in essence saying here, you know, where are all these wise people? Where are all of these so-called experts? Where are all of these people that are so smart? They're nowhere to be found because they don't know God. And in verse 21, he says, God was wise and decided not to let people of, of this world use their wisdom to learn about Him. And in, in using the New Living Translation, it says, God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never know Him through human wisdom. And that is critical for us to understand. Did you know that Jesus hid His message so that people couldn't just pick it up? That you had to be on the same wavelength with Jesus to understand what Jesus was saying. Remember, Jesus was always saying things like, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And what he's saying is, I'm speaking here, but what you need to do is be understanding me over here. That's why Jesus taught in parables. He used parables so that if people didn't really understand what he was saying, all they would hear is a, a, a fun story, an entertaining story. He never taught things to the public in a wide open, straightforward means. You know, he taught in parables. And, you know, when he would heal people, did it ever confuse you why when Jesus would heal someone, he'd say, now don't tell anybody. Why would, a, why would we do that? From a human standpoint, we wouldn't. Because from a human standpoint, we want everybody to know so that that would draw in even greater crowds. It's not the way God does things. He wants to keep things quiet. 
Jesus even prayed in Matthew 11, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. I am thankful that you have hidden these things from those who are so wise and so smart, but you have revealed them to people who are like little children. Here's the thing. To come to salvation, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to be wise. You don't have to be educated. You have to have a simple, childlike faith to believe in Jesus. God's wisdom is a paradox to, to human logic. In human ways of thinking, strength is strong. Weakness is unwanted. Nobody wants to be weak. Intelligence is power. Those are the things that we value. Those are the things that we say, this is what you got to have. But God takes all of that and He turns it upside down. And all of a sudden, in God's way of doing things, strength is found in weakness. And weakness becomes what's strong. Intelligence becomes foolishness. And foolishness becomes what's wise. And, and, and so, as a result... A plain, uneducated, unskilled person who has placed their trust in Jesus Christ and who faithfully and humbly follows Jesus, that person is greater and wiser than the most brilliant college professor, the most brilliant PhD who scoffs at the gospel. That's God's way of doing things. That's God's wisdom. The unbelieving, humanly smart person, the only thing they're ever going to know is what their, their mind can comprehend. And when you compare that to the mind of God, boy, that's nothing at all. But the plain person, here's the thing, the plain old ordinary person who knows God who, who has come to salvation, that person is going to know forgiveness. They're going to know love. They're going to know grace. And they know God Himself. And because they know God Himself, all of heaven is available to them in, in their mind and in their heart and in their resources. You know, we, we humanly thinking, uh, we always are tempted to say, you know, if, if this person, you know, this famous person would just come to, to Christ, or if this entertainer or this scientist or, or this rich person, boy, if they would just come to Christ, boy, they could do such great things. That's not God's way of doing things whatsoever. He chooses the foolish things to work. And when we bring stuff to the table and say, look at all I've got that God can use, God says, I don't want your stuff. I do it through me. I don't do it through you and what you have. That's what 1 Corinthians 1 is telling us. God chose the foolish things of this world to put the wise to shame. So the, the weak things to put the strong to shame and the power, you know, and, and the things that the world thinks are, are worthless, the world thinks are useless, God says, I'm going to use those just so you can see it's not about you, it's about me. The world measures greatness by things like wealth and prestige and intelligence and power and all of that stuff. And God says, you know what? I'm going to make all of that garbage. So in no way, shape, or form do we come to God using any human resource whatsoever. Nothing. 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 Just get it in your mind. Drive it home in your own mind that there is nothing that you or I bring to the table and God says, oh goody, I've been waiting for that. There's nothing. We have nothing to bring. And, and just understand that. So that when, when you're doing service in, in Jesus' name, recognize 
It's not your skill set. You know, I, I get frustrated with people that, that when, when you say, hey, can you help out here? I'm just really not able to do that. Well, you're right. You know, none of us are able if we're being truthful and if we're doing it in our own, in our own strength, in our own power, our own ability, we're not doing any good anyhow because it's got to be done through God. You know, think about this. Even, you know, when, when, if, if we were thinking of a Savior in human terms, we would have the same kind of mind that the Jews did. You know, they were, they were looking for a hero. They were looking for a guy to lead an army and a, a general and a politician who could navigate all of the things and bring about a peace through human strength, through armies and war and, and political maneuvering and all of those sort of things. That's what, they, that's what they were looking for. And so God says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the hero get nailed to a cross. That's, that's how it's going to happen. I'm going to choose something that is an absolute failure and that's how a person is going to experience salvation. Not through a hero who, who conquers with a sword or, or through political power or through money or something like that. And even before that, God presented Himself as the most ordinary person that you could possibly pick. You know, Jesus had no greatness, he had no money, he had no rank, he had no political power, he had no prestige, he had nothing. And that was done on purpose. So that even when in the midst of teaching and in the midst of, of performing miracles, people look, would look at him and say, I just don't get it. Uh, there, there's nothing about this guy that makes me drawn to him. People were flocking to Jesus, not because of Jesus, but because He was feeding them. Not because of Jesus, but because He was healing the sick. They weren't drawn to Him. That's why when He went to the cross, those same people were the same ones saying, crucify Him. They weren't following Jesus. They were following His miracles. And so... In order for a person to come to God, they have to override all human wisdom and logic and, and come so that they comprehend Jesus strictly from God's perspective. That I, there's nothing about this that makes sense and that's why I believe it. That's, that's where we have to find ourselves, And the wisdom of God is so that no person can ever come before God and say, well, yeah, you might have saved me, but I had a part in this. No, we didn't. We have no part in our salvation. You know, verse 28, what the world thinks is worthless, useless, and nothing at all is what God has used. Notice to destroy what the world considers important. When we understand that, then we can finally let go of all of the stuff that we chase after that we think is so important. And, and this is where this is a liberating understanding. You know, most of, most of the energy we invest in isn't in order to put food on our table, it's so that we can have a standard of living. And the, the reality is, is that that stuff isn't what God is about. God, isn't, God is going to give you absolutely everything you need to live. But what we say is, well, I don't really want your standard of living, God. I want the world's standard of living. And we think that's where we're going to find happiness. And, and there isn't any happiness in that. Just look at the world and you can see that really quickly. Now, I, I am not suggesting that you no longer have to mow your yard or take a bath 
or wash your clothes. You know, I, I, I'm not suggesting we just reject all of that. But I am saying that evaluate your life. What is it that you are chasing after? You know, we, we say, well, I'm just trying to put food on the table. No, no. It's so that we can have a, a pleasure style of life. And, and again, I'm not, I'm, you know, it, this is between you and God to figure out. But understand that most of what we do isn't just to live. And, and the reality is, is everything that we have comes from God. So how we use it ultimately comes back to what does God want me doing with what I have? You know, I think, honestly, most of us could take the, the stuff that we worry about and we could take it over and we could put it in the trash can and we would be happier being free from all of that. Now, notice verse 30. It says, you are God's children. Right there. You know, He sent Jesus to save us and to make us wise, acceptable, and holy. When we come to Christ, we are given everything that God has for us. This is, this is such a, a fascinating and wonderful thought here that when you come to salvation in Jesus, God basically loads you up. You know, it's like He just keeps giving you all of the things. And again, understand... We, in our broken, sinful minds, we think that means money. You know, humans, whenever we think God's going to bless you, the first thing we think is money, 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 money. That's not, you know, that's the world's way of thinking. That's what the world values. We have to reject this type of mindset. God will give you everything you need. So when we come to, to Christ and salvation becomes, uh, you know, comes into our life, God is going to give us, and He gives us, and most translations says, uh, say, and Christ has become for us wisdom from God. He is the reason we are right with God. He is our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Understand, God has a purpose for every single human life. I, I said in a recent sermon, you know, remember Jesus, you know, God knows how many hairs you have on your head. If He knows such detail about you, don't you think that He has plans and purpose for you? He knows us. He knows everything about us. And it, it's God's will that no one perish, but everyone have eternal life. And so when, when Christ comes into a life, he, he loads us up with the blessings of salvation. And here is just some of the things that we get. First of all, it says that we become, that Christ has given us wisdom from God. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, first of all, you have to have God's wisdom to come to salvation. You have to accept by faith like that of a child that Jesus died on the cross for you. Again, that's contrary to the way the world thinks. But then there's a wisdom that goes beyond that. We can only, we can only be saved through God's wisdom. And once we are saved, we have to reject human wisdom and begin to live by God's wisdom. And again, this is a, this is a struggle this is because it goes against our, our human nature. Humanly, we want to be powerful. We want to be rich. We want to be successful from the world's standpoints. We want to be viewed as at the top of the pile. You know, that, that's, that's human thinking. And it may be God's will that that happens in some of our lives, but it's not going to happen automatically. Paul talked about that. You know, when he said some of you were, were wise by the world standards, but most of you weren't. Some of you were powerful by the world standards, but most of you weren't. You know, so, so we need to understand that. But when we take on the world's wisdom we will be opposite of what God wants to do. 
When we take on God's wisdom, we will live exactly how God wants us, but it will cause us to live contrary to the way the world views things. Well, what does God's wisdom look like? Well, these are things you've heard before. We are to be servants. We are to be humble. We are to deny ourselves. Because remember, in God's economy, the first shall be last. We're here to serve, not be served. You know, this is, this is God's wisdom at play. And, and I, I, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't really want that. Well, again, you need to understand that's God's way of doing things. And so we reject the way of the world and we pick up God's way of doing things. Because God has chosen the sinful, the weak, the unwise, and He has made them righteous and strong and wise. Why? So that God will be glorified, not us. And here again, that's the struggle of the Christian life, is to understand you must decrease, Jesus must increase. That, you know, make that, um, to use a word from, from the, the people who, um, I hate it when I do this, uh, when, when, when people who meditate, your mantra, you know, if you want to have a mantra, I must decrease, Jesus must increase. That, that needs to be your mindset for how you live your life. You know, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, God commanded light to shine in the dark. Now God is shining in our hearts to let you know that His glory is seen in Jesus Christ. You see, the most simple, uneducated person who humbly, by faith, place their lives in the hands of Jesus is given all of the wisdom of, of God. And they, they are going to have more wisdom than the greatest philosophers ever. You know, you think of Socrates or Plato or Aristotle or Charlie Brown, whoever you go to for your wisdom, for your philosophy. When you commit to Christ and you, you submit to Him and you begin to take in the wisdom of Christ, you are going to have more wisdom than the greatest thinkers that this world can ever produce. And then verse 30, it goes on and it says that we are given righteousness through Christ. We are made right with God. And this is such an important little section. If you're dozing off here, this is a good time to kind of wake up. Um, when, when, we are, when we are in Christ, God looks at us and He pronounces us righteous. Okay? And, and this is so important. The, the way it happens is when a person is saved, um, they are given God's nature. And God's nature is righteousness. Romans 4, 5 says, But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So when God looks at a Christian... What he sees is he sees his son. And he sees the blood of Jesus covering our sin. And, and so he sees righteousness. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you are exchanging your unrighteousness for Jesus' righteousness. And so a born-again believer is given God's wisdom, and He has given God's righteousness. And then it next says that they are sanctified in Christ. That word sanctified again means set apart. And, and what that means um, is that we are, we are set apart by God for His glory, for His purposes. 1 Peter 1.23 you have been born again. This new life did not come from something that dies. It came from something that cannot die. 
You were born again through God's life-giving message that lasts forever. Here's how it works. In our flesh, we still have our old nature. And because it's still there, we can still sin. We can still mess up. But that shouldn't be the norm for us. So as we spiritually mature, as we grow in Christ, sin should become less and less of a a constant issue and it should become more uncomfortable for us when we sin. So when a person is saved, God says, I now pronounce you righteous. And that's a cool thought because, you know, when I look at me, I don't see righteous. I still see all of my sinfulness and all of the things that, that are, I know are gross and, and unpleasant. But when God looks at me, He looks at me through the lens of Jesus' shed blood. And so He sees righteousness. And then as I submit to Christ, and as I walk daily with Christ, I become more and more and more righteous. I become more holy. That's the process of sanctification. I've told you before, think of sanding a board. You know, you have to sand it in order for it to get smoothed. And so when we are saved, we we now have a right relationship with God. And as I walk with God, as I submit to Him, the Holy Spirit begins to transform me. But again, you have to submit to the Holy Spirit. You know, we've all seen people who say, well, I was saved when I was five years old. And that was, it's like, and? No, I was saved when I was five years old. And they're just a mean, hateful, cantankerous, unpleasant person. Why? Because they've never submitted to the Holy Spirit. They still have a a heart of rebellion in them. And as a result, there's not been any transformation. Or the only time that they hear and engage the Word of God is when they come to church. And so imagine if you have a real rough piece of wood, and once a week you sand on it for an hour. And then you put it back on the shelf, and there it sits. And once a week you take it out and you sand on it. That's what coming to church once a week does is you're, you're not really engaging. You need to sand on that sucker constantly. So, you walk with the Spirit. And as you walk in the Spirit, you begin to see the, the evidence of Christ coming out in the life. And then you begin to bear the fruit of the Christian life. The Galatians 5, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And so your life will become more and more transformed. And remember, the goal of the Christian life is to become like Christ. That's that's what we're after. And so you become more and more like Christ. And then lastly, Paul says the believer receives redemption. We have been purchased from the power of sin and, and death, and we have been given new life in Christ. Ephesians 1.14, the Spirit of God uh, is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised in that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify Him. So what happens is when we put all of that together, we fill with pride and we get boastful and we say, oh, look at me! No, that's not at all what happens. Verse 31 says, if you want to brag about something, brag about Jesus. That's what we brag about. Brag about what God has done. What you brag about is, man, look at me. I am an absolute piece of garbage. And God saw value in me, and He saved me, and every day I am becoming more and more like Jesus. And that's a reason to glorify God, not me. That's that's what verse 31 is telling us. We didn't deserve it. We don't earn it. we We didn't do anything. It's not because of who we are. 
that we got saved. It's because of who God is that we're saved. And Paul told the Galatians in Galatians 6.14, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. See, this is where the rub is. Too many of us are still very interested in the world. We still want all that the world has to offer. We're still pushing after all of that. And we're still wanting the world to recognize us and say, Woohoo, look at you, you're a winner, you betcha. And, and the reality is, is that's garbage. God has taken everything that the world has and thrown it on the trash heap. So what we need to do is understand God is the centerpiece. God is the goal. Our ambitions need to be God. And that's what Paul finishes with in, in the last five verses of chapter 2, or you know, verses 1 through 5. He says, I didn't come trying to show you me. I came to show you Jesus. And that's where we need to live. That's where we need to, to think. Die to yourself. Die to what the world says matters. And begin just focusing on Jesus and what Jesus says matter. Begin to practice self-denial. Giving your life to Christ. I keep putting S's on the end of everything. Allow Christ to become the centerpiece of everything you are about. Evaluate every thought you have and say, is this about Jesus or is it about me? And make it about Jesus. Let's, let's pray. Jesus, help us because I know in my own life I have a hard time of getting out of my own way. And... It is entirely part of my sin nature that I think about me pretty much constantly. And Lord, what you have done is you have died so that I don't have that anymore. I'm no longer under the power of sin, but I am still under the control of sin. So help me, dear Jesus, to... Turn control over to you through discipline and allow you to reign in my life, to be in control in my life. Help me to allow you to be, be supreme. Thank you. And I just, I, I pray for each of us that same prayer that we will desire that above all else. We won't live, a, live for self. We will live for you. And Father, my prayer now is that any person that's a part of this service, if they have yet to turn their life over to you, that I, I pray that today you have given them the, the wisdom, your wisdom to understand that they need to turn it over to you and allow you to become their Lord and Savior. That it is only through you that they can have righteousness. And it is only through your death on the cross that they can be saved. Help us, Father, to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation is a time for you to respond to God. So if, if He's speaking to you, um, do what He's telling you. Please stand. Lord, I come, <clears throat> I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, Oh, God.
Join with me in prayer. Father, thank you so much for all you have done. We truly need you more than we can ever possibly realize. I, I, I guess I understand that when we get to heaven, it'll all be perfectly clear. But until then, uh, we are certainly fumbling around a lot. And I just pray that you will help each of us to have the clarity we need for salvation first. And that you will help us to walk in faith with you. God, we need you. And I thank you that you have made yourself available to us. And I give you all praise now in Jesus' name.